when a sculptor is asked to represent a person, the first job for the artist is to really kind of, you know, why is this person being honored in that way? Why is there a tribute? And with Ken Jones, it became very, very, very quickly evident why he, he's such a deserving person, why there should be a memorial to him in Blynhaven. I was so impressed with the footage I saw of Ken when he ran, he ran like the wind. Nobody could catch him. It was magic to watch him run. And I thought that sculpture has really got to show that. I certainly have done sporting sculptures before, but each one is different. You know, doing a boxing champion for Drogheda in Ireland or doing uh, the tennis terracotta warriors, which was, you know, the likeness of Federer, but the body of a terracotta warrior, which has got, you know, that's, that's, there's a lot of leeway there for interpretation. But with the sculpture of Ken Jones, there's no room for interpretation. You've got to get it right. When you're working on a life-size sculpture, you are arriving little by little at the final shape and at the final likeness of that person. And it all looks out of proportion to begin with on a sculpture that's life-size because arriving at the final shape involves a lot of different steps. And it's a very gradual process. And then all of a sudden, it starts to look like a human. And then it starts to look like that human called Ken Jones, you know. It is very much a gradual process of arriving at that exact likeness. It was really important to me to make sure that the anatomy was absolutely spot on. So... I asked a friend of mine, Dr. Miles Humberstone, he's a neurologist, but he used to teach anatomy at St. George's University in London. And he came to the studio and pointed out to me which muscles would do what exactly, um, which little bulges would show and so forth on the arms, on the, you know, on the hands, on the legs, you know, um, to get it completely right. And uh, it was an interesting process both for me and for him. It was, I think my, it was the first time that Miles was uh, involved in advising on a sculpture. And it was the first time I was bringing a, an anatomy specialist along on the team. Well, most people don't realize how many steps are involved in bronze casting to go from clay to bronze. There are so many different steps. Technicians make a mold. In order to make the mold, they have to literally cut the sculpture into pieces that are moldable. You don't make just a gigantic big mold on, on the sculpture. You cut individual pieces of the sculpture and then you mold those separately, each individually. The, the sculpture ended up in 11 pieces in total. Once all these different parts have been cut up on the sculpture, you then have to mold each one of them individually. And you're creating two-part molds for every single one of those sections. It requires a lot of steps in order to get a faithful reproduction of the sections of clay. You need to create a void between the clay and a plaster jacket that will enable you to pour liquid rubber into a feed hole and then the air has to escape from the mold so that the rubber can settle absolutely everywhere and faithfully around the clay beneath it. And these then later uh, have wax put into them and the wax will be the thickness that you want the bronze to be. So the wax is painted into the surface of the mold and then the, the sections are put back together and then the sculptor comes back and works on various individual sections of the positive in wax. So now you've got an arm in wax, another arm in wax, the ball in wax, you've got the torso in wax, and all of these have to be worked on individually uh, by the sculptor to get to clean up the seams and, you know, make any adjustments because wax is a very hard material which can there much harder than clay and much more precise. And so you can make some minor adjustments and details in the wax that you wouldn't have been able to do in the clay. Once you've got the wax sections made, you have to construct a system of runners and risers that come up to a central cup and invest those in ceramic shell. 
the each piece gets dipped into a slurry and then coated with a very fine sand. And this happens three times. And each time the slurry becomes thicker and the sand used is coarser. And that then creates a shell around the wax. It gets fired into a kiln. And here in the, in the kiln, it's brought up to a temperature of a thousand degrees so that all the wax will be lost out of those ceramic shells. The wax gets recycled and you then are left with empty ceramic shells which are placed into a bed of sand so that they will be sort of supported very, 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 very well and be able to withstand the heat of the pour. So you have to have ceramic shells well supported by beds of sand and then you melt the bronze ingots into a crucible and you pour each one of those now empty cups where the wax once was and was lost from, the bronze is poured into those. And there were 11 sections for the Ken Jones sculpture. Right after the pour, as soon as that bronze has cooled down enough, one removes the investments, the ceramic shell investments now cast with bronze in them and you start to break away the shell. And as you start to break away the shell, you're able to see, was the pour successful? Because you can always have miscastings, in which case you'd have to go back to the, you know, wax stage and start over again from a wax stage. So you very eagerly break away that ceramic shell and you reveal the bronze underneath. And it still has the runners and the cup attached to it. You know, it doesn't look anything like the finished bronze will look. It's, it's rough. When the pieces of the sculpture, which have been cast individually, move into the metal part of the foundry, the idea here is to weld all the pieces back together and clean up any seams in the metal and any little pitting that might have occurred from sand getting into the casting. And so the metal is worked and chiseled and chased and reassembled and then sandblasted. Then of course I as the artist I you know I come back in and I I look at this and then say you know over here a bit more uh, smoothing or could you get that little pockmark out you know and so forth. So it, it, eventually I'm happy with it and then from there it goes into the final stage which is the patination. A patina is something that is created on a sculpture and each sculpture will have a different patination. Some are patinated to be greenish, some are blackish, some are bluish, some are brownish. And usually you want to choose a patina that's going to look good on that particular sculpture. For Ken Jones, I just thought a warm, uh, very natural sort of brown would be the right sort of tone and the right sort of color. And that's achieved by applying chemicals with a brush to the heated metal and then stippling it on because you don't want it to look like it's painted on to the heated metal and then heating it some more with a blowtorch and then in the end waxing it. When the protective beeswax is applied to the sculpture it's very exciting because now the true color of the patination is revealed and you don't really see the final effect until that protective beeswax is applied. It's a magic moment. Ken Jones is a legendary figure, not just in Wales, but in the world of rugby. His sporting achievements are huge. He was a sporting all-rounder, an Olympic sporting silver medalist, who won Commonwealth and European honours. He will forever be remembered as the man who scored the winning try against the All Blacks for Wales in 1953. I remember someone saying one of the people who had run against Ken said when he started to run, nobody could catch him. And I wanted to capture that in my sculpture, and I hopefully I have it. When I first saw the statue, immediately I could see a player of the 50s. The artist who did this caught that amazingly well. Different shape altogether from the rugby player of today. And 
anyone who knew Ken or played around that time would know that that was a player who played around the, the 50s and 40s. Superb it is. I can't get over how, how good it is.